coming up on Market to Market. An explosion at an Omaha animal feed plant kills two people and injures more than a dozen. Biofuel supporters voice their disapproval of proposed cuts to the renewable fuel standard. And officials work with agricultural producers to improve water quality in a leading farm state. Those stories and market analysis with John Roach, next. This is the Friday, January 24 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Equity markets plunged late this week as investors beat a hasty retreat to the sidelines. The carnage began on Thursday as the Dow declined 176 points on news of an economic slowdown in China. One day later, the Dow fell more than 300 points to record its lowest close of the year. The S&P 500 followed suit with its largest two-day decline since 2012. Meanwhile, bitterly cold weather is heating things up in the energy sector. Natural gas futures prices exceeded $5 Friday for the first time in three and a half years. Electricity prices are also on the rise as power utilities struggle to meet higher than normal winter demand. And propane soared to record highs this week in the Midwest, costing those who need to fill their tanks $1 to $200 more than just last month. But even as some consumers braced themselves this week for bitterly cold weather, others were more concerned with matters of life and limb. Federal safety investigators are determining whether structural problems and a dust explosion contributed to an industrial building collapse in Omaha this week that killed two workers and injured 17 others. Inspectors with the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, are working with structural engineers and combustible dust experts as part of their investigation into Monday's accident at the International Nutrition Building. The plant makes nutritional products that are added to livestock and poultry feed. Some witnesses reported hearing an explosion before the building's top two floors collapsed into the first floor. But others have suggested that the sound and fire, which burned some workers, resulted from the collapse. It was crazy. Um, yeah, I just turned on my phone. I just like turned on my phone to, um, to see if I can get any visibility because it was like pitch black in there. All I saw was like the fire on the side, so I just thought the building was on fire and everything. So I just tried to get to, to another exit. An OSHA spokesperson says it likely will be weeks before investigators know the exact cause of the accident. The chance of finding any victims that are, are alive has uh, is no longer there. Unfortunately, Monday's deaths were not the first workplace fatality to occur at the plant. OSHA records show International Nutrition was assessed more than $13,000 in penalties for a 2002 accident that killed a 45-year-old worker. The employee perished after falling into a moving mixer that he was cleaning. The Obama administration sent shockwaves through the Corn Belt late last year when it proposed cutting the federal mandate to blend ethanol into U.S. gasoline supplies. The plan has drawn sharp criticism from biofuel supporters who claim the Renewable Fuel Standard, or RFS, has helped to create nearly 400,000 jobs. This week, ethanol proponents held a hearing in the heartland to voice their support of the RFS. But they were wrong. They in what was more of a rally than a hearing, MP, dignitaries MP, representing MP, groups from Washington, D.C. to Main Street joined and Iowa Governor Terry Branstad to send a message to the Environmental Protection Agency. Big Oil is delighted that the EPA has recommended weakening the renewable fuel standard, but they're not satisfied. They want to repeal it altogether. We're not asking them to change policy. We're asked to just stick with what's worked. At issue is whether the EPA will reduce the RFS by 3 billion gallons this year, reducing the required annual output to 15 billion gallons. Nearly half of the cuts would be made in ethanol blending requirements. This proposal is backtracking on the accomplishments made in the past 10 years. Representatives from Iowa's Washington delegation who spoke at what was billed as the hearing in the heartland unanimously called on the EPA to leave the RFS alone. And when you have an, an administration that can't make a decision on a Keystone XL pipeline, but can make a decision on this to back an industry up and freeze it in place and what, weaken it so the petroleum industry can buy it out at a few cents on the dollar, there will be support for it then if they own it. And if you spent more time in rural Iowa, the president might realize that if you take too many steps backwards in an Iowa pasture, 
uh, without knowing why or where you're going, you may just step in something. <laughs> and, and Republican Senator Charles Grassley of Iowa characterized the proposed rule change as short-sighted. This investment has improved the environment. It's improved the economic well-being of Iowans. It's improved our balance of trade and our national security. And Most of those who took the podium expressed concern over the potential loss of jobs, the ripple effect on local economies, and the potential for reduced investment in advanced biofuels. Who in the world is going to invest $200 million into a cellulosic ethanol plant that's going to produce 30 million gallons of ethanol, as innovative, creative, and as much opportunity as there is, if you sense the political dynamics can completely shift under your feet in a matter of a decision or two. Ethanol plant so. managers and owners the also spoke about investment in the future of the U.S. fuel industry. I would ask, how does a country like Brazil, where they drive the same Fords, Chevys, and Toyotas that we do here, blend 25% ethanol in their motor fuel, and have for over a decade, while the U.S. cannot get to past 10%. The answer is big oil's death grip on the U.S. consumer. Politicians and ethanol plant managers were joined by representatives of the corn and biofuels industries who spoke to the crowd. Diesel plants. I call upon President Obama today to pick up that phone and to do the right thing for Iowa and America, to do what he promised us he would do when he was here in Iowa, and that is to not mess with the RFS. It was designed to spur the use of renewable fuels, not reward the oil sector for its efforts to impede their development and adoption. Nearly all of those making statements were ethanol supporters, but there were a few who voiced their support for the proposed cuts. So um, I don't think we should think the sky is falling here and that, that everything's going to go. Yeah, we're looking just for a little more balance here. Thank you. Most of the rhetoric focused on political and economic downsides of changes to the RFS. However, one speaker focused on the human cost of energy security. The Iraqi war, for the most part, is over now. Ten years later, we have paid a heavy toll to stabilize the free flow of oil. Over that same time period, I'm unaware of a single casualty caused by the production of ethanol. I'm unaware of a single serviceman who committed suicide after deployment due to renewable fuels. I'm unaware of a prosthetic limb or wheelchair being fitted for renewable fuels. The comment period on proposed changes to the RFS ends Tuesday. The state of Iowa typically leads the nation in corn production, and the Agriculture Department reports the average statewide yield in 2011 was 172 bushels per acre. While Iowa growers enjoy some of the most fertile soils in the nation, that kind of production would not be possible without fertilizer. But the same amendments that yield such abundance pose a threat to the environment if they find their way into local waterways. And that's a growing problem in the Hawkeye State. So much of a problem, in fact, the Iowa Environmental Protection Commission announced this week it will pay Iowa State University more than $500,000 to test and monitor water quality in 130 Iowa lakes over the next three years. Increasingly, however, growers and environmental wa watchdogs are working together to protect and improve water quality. Market to Market examined some of their efforts and discovered things appear to be changing for the better. Paul Yeager explains. In 2013, Iowa recorded its wettest April in 141 years. Nitrogen not absorbed by crops the previous year meandered its way into local waterways and streams as runoff. And the two rivers that supply water to Des Moines, the state's largest city, contain record levels of nitrates. By law, the Environmental Protection Agency requires that drinking water contains no more than 10 milligrams of nitrates per liter. But the Raccoon River tested at 24 milligrams per liter last spring, while the Des Moines River contained 18. And the person responsible for maintaining safe drinking water for half a million central Iowans points the finger directly at agriculture as the source of the problem. There are urban contributors to uh, runoff and to pollution. I don't mean to disparage that, but the idea that feeding the world is somehow this uh, password that lets us get by any responsibility for poisoning our neighbors is a real problem for me. In response to the record level of nitrates, the Des Moines Water Works switched on its $3.7 million nitrate removal facility for the first time 
since 2007. The system, which is believed to be the largest in the world, costs $7,000 a day to run, and the bill for the nearly three months of operation amounted to over half a million dollars. Operating and maintenance, that's very costly when you start putting in treatment systems. A lot of communities will look at drilling a new well, but that's not a guarantee if they drill a new well that it's not going to be drawing a contaminant such as nitrates into that new well. So Becky Ortman is the Source Water Protection Coordinator for Iowa's Department of Natural Resources. According to Ortman, 30% of Iowa's 880 municipal water supplies are highly susceptible to contamination from nitrates. Many of those municipalities serve small communities where an expensive nitrate removal system would be unfeasible. Most communities that are proactive will say, I want to take care of this before they reach the uh, maximum load that they're allowed to. EPA designates you can have a uh, 10 MCL is what the nitrate level is. And so once they hit that, then they have to find alternate sources of drinking water for their community. It's kind of like planting the tree. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Over 70% of Iowa's drinking water comes from groundwater, which is tapped by drilling wells. Because it is subsurface does not mean it is pollution free. They regulate how much you have to test according to where your levels are. So since we're at an eight average, we test um, every month we send a sample in that gets reported to the DNR. We at Griswold, we test it ourselves every day um, just for our knowledge. We're not required to do that, but we test every day. Perilously close to test numbers that would cap its wells, the town of Griswold turned to the Iowa DNR to explore possible solutions. With a population of only around 1,000, less expensive solutions aimed at preventing contaminated water rather than treating it were explored. Our primary objective when we go into a community that has an existing contaminant problem is to identify if that contaminant is a point source or a non-point source, and then to try to better define the capture zone area of where their drinking water is coming from. The capture zone is the area where a well draws its water. Once the capture zone is identified, the source of the pollution can be determined and addressed. In Griswold, the source of contamination was determined to be agriculture. But a solution proved elusive until area farmers were invited to help develop a strategy that would reduce the amount of nitrates entering the water supply. We was just trying to do it all ourselves and once we asked them it was like they come in and they, they were so much enthused about helping uh, protect our water. Not only, not only the city's water but they're also, since we've started this, they've started doing it in other areas around Griswold that's not in the in our capture zone. The solution reached in Griswold was to plant cover crops in the identified capture zone. According to the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, 92% of nitrates in Iowa's waterways come from non-point sources and cover crops are the best single farming practice to keep both soil and nitrates from running off farmland. The finding is the culmination of two years of work by the Iowa Department of Agriculture the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and Iowa State University. We have some uh, land that lays around the city wells and we're doing a cover crop to try to control the nitrates in the water. Uh, the nitrates, the grizzled water has been moving up slowly and we're trying to, it's not dangerous levels yet, but we're trying to get ahead of it before they do. Cousins chose a cover crop of ryegrass, which was seeded by plain on standing corn. It is not the first conservation measure that he has adopted to protect Griswold's water supply. We put a buffer strip around here. It's a 200-foot radius around the well probably, oh, 15 years ago, something like that. I thought, thinking at that time that would help, and it, it probably did help some, but now we're, we're putting uh, cover crops in to help, help uh, control the nitrates. And we've also gone to uh, spring-applied anhydrous, plus another split application where we're put more liquid in. There are many solutions to the puzzle of how to protect municipal water supplies. Next week, we'll look at some of the alternative cover crops farmers are planting 
as well as other conservation practices employed by rural communities to keep nitrates out of their water. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. Grain markets traded modestly higher this week, but that may be cause for celebration among wheat growers as their commodity had its first winning week since November. For the week, March wheat gained two cents, while the nearby corn contract moved six cents higher. Soybeans' time above $13 proved to be brief as the March contract settled with a weekly loss of 32 cents. Soybean meal followed suit, giving up $8.80 per ton. In the softs, cotton continued its rally as the March contract advanced by more than 40 cents per hundredweight. In the dairy market, Class Three milk traded in record territory this week as the February contract gained 47 cents while the deferred contract was unchanged. Another big week over in livestock as the April cattle contract settled with a weekly gain of 80 cents. March feeders advanced by more than a dollar and the April lean hog contract rallied more than two dollars. In the financials, the euro improved 15 basis points against the dollar. Crude oil advanced by $2 per barrel. Comex Gold gained $12.40 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index gained nearly 10 points to settle at $625.70. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is our senior market analyst, John Roach. John, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. We talked at the start of the show about the sell-off in the Dow these last two days of the week. Give us a little insight into how that might have an effect on the commodity markets. Well, I think it might have an effect on, on a few different markets. Uh, first of all, uh, cotton, uh, which has been uh, uh, strong uh, because of uh, uh, relatively tight supplies except for the Chinese supplies, uh, worried uh, if we get the worries that came into the stock market was that the Chinese economy might be slowing down. And if the Chinese economy slows down, that really has an impact quickly over into the cotton market. So that might be the first one. And we have a sell signal in cotton uh, going home on Friday. So if you're needing to make some sales and thinking about making some sales, this is probably a pretty good time to do that. We really are interested in, in selling new crop cotton whenever we can get back up over 80 cents. All right, and we ended there, uh, just a little above. All right, well, now let's take a look over at the wheat market. Uh, we saw it hold steady this week, gain nearly a penny. Uh, the, the question everybody's asking is the bottom in in the wheat market, are we finally competitive worldwide to see some export growth and some demand build back up? Well, we're, we're definitely competitive. Uh, after several months here of being beaten in all the export business, uh, we're competitive there, and uh, and we're seeing some business that is taking place. Uh, the uh, the supplies on wheat worldwide and in the United States are really not all that burdensome. We certainly had a very big crop, uh, but when you look at the ending stocks estimates, we're, we're, they're not all that burdensome, particularly in the United States. Uh, so. There's there's room for this market to move higher uh, if we can change the psychology a little bit. In addition to that, winter wheat uh, growing in this country has had some really cold weather to deal with, uh, without very much snow cover here recently. And the same thing in the in the in Russia, where they've had uh, less than uh, normal snow cover uh, and and very cold temperatures. So so there's a couple of different things out here to give the wheat market a rally, but we sure have had a hard time getting it going. Now you mentioned the the colder weather the potential for winter kill both in the U.S. and Russia. Have either of those things uh, caused you to put a sell signal on any of the wheat contracts out there? We really haven't been a seller of wheat since back in November. We, on our last big rally we had, and then the market just fell away from us. And so we really haven't had what we thought was a decent selling opportunity, although any day would have been a decent selling opportunity when you look back at the chart to see how much the price has declined. Uh, so we think the market uh, will give us some better opportunities than what we have right now. We're hoping that these bottoms will hold and they'll and spur some rally from here. We might see a bit of a correction and, and maybe... Well, we sure hope so. Uh, we, we still have the specs very heavily short in Chicago and and uh, so we're just hoping here that we'll, we'll see a short covering rally and, and maybe even a little bit of worry about crop size. All right. Well, now let's take a look over at the corn market. Uh, we have seen corn hold above the... Uh, the place it popped to after the January report, 436 right now. Where does the old crop corn market go from here? Well, the old crop corn market uh, is also coming into its own. We're, we're seeing good export sales and sales report today. Uh, and we have very few 
uh, competitors in the world right now that, uh, that have available supplies. Most of the competitors have sold through their supplies or well into their supplies. Uh, the South American uh, crop uh, is smaller because of smaller acreage, and the shipping capacity there is going to be dedicated to soybeans rather than corn. So we become the, the number one market here, and we've started to see uh, uh, basis values over on the river uh, reflecting that increased demand. So we think that the corn market has made its wintertime low or is close to ha having made its wintertime low, and we, th and we expect to see some recoveries in, into the spring as people start to focus out ahead. The supplies this upcoming year, uh, the demand is going to be very large, and we're going to have to have record supplies in the world again this year in order to supply that demand. So, so we think that the, the corn market will have some better days ahead, and, uh, and we're looking for uh, some opportunities to make sales on rallies. All right, and that being said, looking at the, the recent price movement, both old and new crop, you, you don't see any selling opportunities today? No, not today. Uh, we, we had a bounce up that we triggered our sell signal. We're close if we uh, get another surge back to being uh, uh, willing to make some sales. Uh, we're not willing to make sales today. We're, we're going to wait for a little more of a bounce. All right, well, now let's take a look at soybeans. Uh, flip side of the coin there, we saw soybeans being a, a, a good market to watch all winter, kind of a Cinderella story the past uh, week, really. We saw it uh, begin to sell off. What are your thoughts on old crop soybeans? Old crop soybeans uh, uh, have, uh, in the United States, been getting the benefit of no soybeans available out of South America. So we've been meeting the market's demand uh, for the last several months. But the South American crop, the Brazilian crop, uh, is in the process of being harvested. There may be up to around 5% harvested. That crop is making its way to the port. That's going to become major competition to us as we look down the road uh, in the next month to six weeks. Uh, so we're hoping for one more surge back, one more rally back in the beans. Uh, and at that point, we're going to get real serious about cleaning out the bins uh, unless you want to gamble on a weather problem on into the summer. Uh, we, we just had a sell signal on beans a week ago today, uh, and so we were able to trigger some sales. We've been able to trigger some sales, uh, so we've had opportunities, but we think those opportunities are about ready to pass. Even though we're more optimistic about corn, we're less optimistic about beans. Certainly. With the, uh, the growing acreage in South America and the quality of the crop down there, that makes sense. Now, is this Chinese slowdown going to have a major impact on the bean market as we work through the rest of this year? We don't know. Uh, so far, it's not. Uh, so far, uh, although the, the Chinese uh, were rumored to have canceled a couple, three cargoes, uh, shifting it maybe to Brazil, export sales out today, another strong week of export sales of soybeans. In fact, is if you look at the export sales numbers, we really don't have any more beans to sell either. Uh, but we keep seeing those numbers show up every week. Uh, the demand still is there. So th those numbers may get shifted to another destination, or we may just really eat down into uh, our ending stock. So, so without, I don't want to really be bearish on old crop beans because of the tight supply. I just think it's going to be very hard to get much. One more rally, and that's about it, before we get a lot of competition out of South America. Uh, I'm not sure whether the Chinese economy is going to uh, have problem causes problems later in the year, um, but at least at this juncture, they've really not slowed down their buying. All right. Well, now let's take a look at livestock over in the cattle market. We saw the cattle on feed report come out today. Anything in there that's going to spark the trade one way or the other come Monday? It wasn't really. Um, there were no real surprises there. It's pretty much in line with what everybody was was looking for. The numbers all came right in the middle of their range of estimates. Uh, but the cattle market uh, uh, had a very strong week this week in the cash. Uh, the futures market kind of trailed off at the end. We do have sell signals in cattle. Uh, it may be an opportunity here to be uh, starting to, uh, uh, to uh, hedge some cattle forward or, or perhaps get some puts underneath of them. Uh, but it's not because we're really afraid of the market. Uh, we, we are concerned, though, when we see the stock market fall like this uh, that we've seen in the past couple days because you can change people's attitudes just as you are trying to push this high-priced beef out on the, on the retail shelves. Uh, so the consumer has not yet seen the highest price uh, on beef, and we don't know if that demand will taper off when they see that demand. But certainly if the psychology of markets in general are starting to, to, to turn a little negative, uh, that could 
uh, uh, influence the consumer's buying decisions. All right. Now, you mentioned you've got sell signals on cattle. Does that apply to feeders as well? Is this a seller's market on the feeder cattle side? The feeder cattle are also giving us sell signals. Uh, the uh, uh, if, you're, if you're on that side of it, uh, uh, that may be an excellent opportunity to, uh, to look at getting some price protection. All right. Well, now let's take a look at the hog market. Uh, we've been faced with the PED, uh, high feed costs in the past, and then this week we saw the price jump uh, about a little over $2. Uh, where do you see the hog market headed? We think in general the hog market moves higher. Uh, but again, we've got sell signals on the charts. So, so we're up into price areas that if you're looking for places to be putting some hedges on or getting some puts, this is probably the right the right area to be looking. But but we're not negative the market. We think price levels will be firm. We think that we're, we're really getting into some of the uh, uh, better uh, uh, supply uh, periods here as we move forward. All right. Well, now let's take a look over at the energy side. We've had a lot of talk as we've endured this cold weather throughout the country, the polar vortex and so on. Um, as we watch crude oil prices, for instance, we've been bouncing in that $90 range. Do you see crude moving one way or the other? What's your expectation on, on crude oil? Every, every time uh, uh, I hear the talk about the oil we're finding in this country and, and, the, uh, and the amount that... Uh, uh, that we're getting out of the uh, the various uh, uh, areas in this country, uh, they're, they're all bigger numbers. And so it would seem to be very hard to get energy prices, the oil prices, to rally very far when the supply is as adequate as, as we're seeing right now. So no, I don't think we have a big up move in oil. We have certainly had a big move in, in, uh, in propane and, and in uh, 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 natural gas, uh, and that's another reason, let's shift back over to the livestock market, another reason to be a little bit afraid of these higher prices uh, because the consumer has uh, higher heating bills and high, maybe higher electric bills to pay too. Uh, but in general, uh, energy prices, uh, uh, we think, will be will we'll stay relatively under control once we get through this weather situation. Once we get through the weather, all the folks out there watching in the Midwest with this high-priced protein, uh, excuse me, propane, might see a little bit of a break. We think so. When we, when we finally get some clearing in the weather, or some warming in the weather. All right. Fingers crossed. Thanks for being with us, John Roach. Thanks, Mike. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But John and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Markets Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed and Facebook account exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll continue our examination of efforts to improve water quality in Iowa. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content.